Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Mairead Hurley, and I'm Head of Research and Learning in Science Gallery at Trinity College Dublin. So this is the third in a series of events called Confluence. And with this series, we hope to provide a meeting point or a merging of ideas in relation to science learning. It's the first one that we've done online, and we hope it won't be the last. So these events are hosted by us here in Science Gallery Dublin, and they're focused at a national level, but they feed into this European-wide project called System 2020, which we coordinate, which really gives us the opportunity to examine informal science learning in Ireland, but also in the context of Europe. So throughout this project, we've had a, a strong focus on equity. And if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that there are persistent inequities in our field, which have been brought even more to the fore during the COVID-19 pandemic. So over the next hour and 15 minutes or so, we're going to delve into that topic in a little more depth. We'll introduce you very quickly to some of the results of System 2020. We'll introduce our four panel contributors. We'll share some pre-recorded comments and questions from our youth contributors. And then we'll open up the discussion to you, our audience. So as we go along, um, please feel free to say hello to us and to one another. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who know one another and it'd be great to see who's here. Um, so you can use the chat box to do that. Um, you can also share any comments that you have on what's being said and any relevant links that you think the rest of the audience might like to, to hear more about. If you have specific questions for our panelists, can you please leave them in the Q&A box? So that's down below, you'll find that uh, beside the chat function and we'll use that to keep track of all the questions. We'll do our best to get through as many as we can at the end, um, but it may be tight to get time for everything. So we are recording this session and after the event, we'll send out an email with a link to the recording. We'll share any links that have come up in the chat as we go along. And we'll also send you um, a quick evaluation survey or feedback survey. And we'd really love to hear back from you on your thoughts on this event, the format, whether there's a need for more and any other comments that you might want to share. So that's enough from me. Um, I'm very happy to introduce you to my colleague, Sophie Perry, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about System 2020. So thanks and welcome, Sophie. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Sophie and I work as Research and Learning Coordinator with Maraid at Science Gallery Dublin. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about why, why we think this is an important conversation to be having. Um, so as Mairead mentioned, the System 2020 project has been going on for two and a bit years now. Um, and as part of it, we've created the System 2020 map, which maps STEAM learning organizations all across Europe and Israel. Um, but as well as being a community of practitioners, we're also a research project, and we've been able to do some really interesting research during our time in the System 2020 project. So one of the key things that we found um, through doing what, would, what is the first um, research project of its kind, in that it's a longitudinal survey with young people aged from 10 to 20 all across Europe, and it explores their attitudes and experiences with science. Um, so what we found from the survey is that there is a science learning divide. So partaking in informal science learning and enjoying science and feeling that science is relevant to you is more likely if you're from a highly educated family. So that's to say that although science is something that we need and we use every day and we all enjoy in our daily lives or we all, we all benefit from in our daily lives, it's not something that is equally distributed among people. Um, and we were able to identify three key barriers. So those are socio-cultural. So that's to say things like the education level of your parents, maybe what kinds of jobs they do, your self-identification as science-y, um, and your ability to self-direct your science learning. And these, you can kind of see that they're quite self-reinforcing. So if barriers like your parents' educational level um, or the types of jobs that they do mean that you're less likely to be encouraged to doing science, then of course you'll begin to identify yourself as not a particularly sciencey person. And if you can't see the relevance of science and you're not encouraged to identify yourself in that way, then the ability to self-direct your learning is again minimized. So this can really reinforce itself. Um, but we also found in the research that this divide can be minimized. So 
we found that learners from low educational backgrounds are more likely to enjoy science if their teachers support them to engage in STEAM related activities. So that's to say that if they get support from their schools to engage in activities that combine science and the arts, then they're more likely to enjoy and see the relevance of science. And this is also more likely if their peers are enjoying the science too. We also found that partaking in informal science learning workshops, so that science workshops outside of school, can increase young people's recognition of science in their everyday life. So this kind of indicates that informal and non-formal science learning institutions uh, can really act as a lever. And if they work together with schools to introduce um, activities that pair science with the arts and other disciplines, then they can be a, a way, if they're done correctly, to really increase the, the availability and the relevance of science to young people. And we also found that these kind of workshops and learnings can foster skills like creativity, collaboration and communication. So as well as, so we found the bad news, we found the levers to turn this into good news, um, and then coronavirus came along, and this has really changed everything. So initial research so far from um, the School of Education at Trinity College Dublin has really shown that coronavirus is widening the science learning divide. So while schools have been closed and museums have been closed, learning online has not been equally distributed. So teachers in DESH schools in Ireland were three times more likely to report low engagement from their students than teachers from non-DESH schools. And DESH schools are a designation of schools in Ireland that are serving underserved students. And three of the key barriers here were identified as a lack of interest, a lack of support and a lack of technology. And I think the really important things here are a lack of support and a lack of technology. And we see that intersects with what could be the barriers to engaging with informal science learning as well, which prevents informal science learning then from acting as a way to minimize this divide. There was a bit of good news, which is that learning de delivery did make a difference. So if interactive approaches um, are used, then this positively impacts student engagement. But the issue with this is, and the issue with coronavirus is that these interactive approaches have to be engaged with majoritatively online. So things like access to technology, access to communication devices are really important to allow this. Um, and that's really why we want to talk today about the way that coronavirus has impacted um, science learning and the equity and access of science learning, because it's really changed, it's really changed the way that we think about it and changed the way that a lot of us are approaching this. Um, so, I think, yeah, to, to explore this, I think Mairead's gonna introduce our panelists and tell us a little bit about how we'll, how we'll go through this discussion. Yeah, um, actually, I'm not going to introduce them much more than to say our first panelist is going to be uh, Kate Delaney from Make, Create, Innovate, but I'm gonna let Kate introduce herself and her work and uh, then we'll have Francis and Rob, followed by, sorry, then we'll have Vicky Toomey Lee, then, no, sorry, I've gone wrong. Um, after Kate, we'll have Rob O'Sullivan from CIT Blackrock Castle. We'll have Vicky Toomey Lee from Dublin Maker, and we'll have Claire Reardon from Curum. So we'll hand over to Kate now. Thanks, guys. I'm just going to uh, share my screen there. I just want to make sure uh, everybody can see it. Is that okay? They're coming through. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, great. So my name is Kate. I'm founder of Make Create Innovate. I'm just going to take you through just a couple of, I, I suppose, our learnings which will really echo uh, to, to many degrees and um, what's just been introduced there by Sophie. And um, we are a socially minded enterprise. Uh, we're a mobile makerspace delivering hands-on creative tech workshops and courses. And we work with people of all ages in across education sectors, including uh, third level and cultural institutions, as well as you know, community organizations and then formal education at primary and post-primary. And our main approach is a constructivist learning theory and experiential learning theory. So learning by doing, and then respecting the experience of the, the learner that, that comes into the space and, and, and integrating the reflective uh, process there too. Um, we encourage all participants to take a greater responsibility for their own learning, uh, finding their own answers to questions that arise. And we, we allow space for reflection about how we learn and how we interact with others. And we really do firmly believe in adopting a beginner's mindset. Um, we believe that our job is to inquire with the learner and to model curiosity and just to be as interested in what's happening as they are. 
So why steam? I think we're probably uh, uh, preaching to the choir here um, in terms of why steam is so valuable. I think for the for the purposes of this uh, this piece, um, I suppose for us really as well, it's again touching on what Sophie just mentioned there around creativity. And for us, it's the creative process that really allows that kind of exploration of of science, technology, maths, and other subjects too. Um, I think the, the possibility of cross-curricular experience there, which can be uh, often lacking in formal education, um, and, and the collaboration part as well, I think it can be so enriching. So there's many reasons why, and I'm gonna take you through, I suppose, our uh, uh, kind of approach to it during the shutdown. And, um, you know, we know from, you know, the thousands of people that have participated in our workshops, how successful a STEAM approach to education is. Um, but we didn't really know at all how much we could achieve uh, in an online setting. And so we sat about this with a My, the Mice Place project, the My Place project, which is a collaboration uh, between Fingal County Council and uh, Creative Ireland, and it was part of Creating an Oak. And so it was a three, a red, three to four week project, um, an introduction uh, to 3D modeling in week one, and then an introduction to circuitry in week two, and then working with sound in week three. And it involved weekly pre-recorded videos made available uh, online each week, and then uh, weekly uh, Zoom sessions uh, as, as part of that process too. Um, we also uh, sent out kits to uh, each team or each group um, as they worked from week to week and it was up to them to show um, how the project, how they were progressing in the project and they documented that process with uh, videos and photos and texts and that kind of thing. So really my place was about giving opp the opportunity uh, for, for young people and, and their family members uh, to show the world a place that they love um, and redesign a place in the way that they'd like for the future. And so participants were given the opportunity to reimagine themselves as architects, cyclists, artists and gardeners, citizens of Ireland with uh, a story to tell about their place as they see it now or as they'd like it to be. So the, the, this is week one, just showing you a couple of pictures. So it's 3D modeling and we was really, the emphasis was on absolutely as low cost as possible. So we sent out kits uh, that involve kind of basic electronics, but also the emphasis is really on kind of finding materials at home, really going through your recycle bin and uh, seeing what's there and how it can be used and, and, and thought about differently. And this is week two, uh, an introduction to circuitry. So they worked with LEDs and batteries, uh, copper wire and uh, built uh, parallel circuits. And, and basically, I suppose, started exploring kind of lighting up their piece or how they'd like to light it up. And then week three was working with sound and how they'd like their piece to sound. So they were sent out and really uh, basic kind of sound recording kits. So here are some of the, the finished products. And I'm just gonna show you a video of one of the pieces that's just about a minute long. So just let me know uh, if, Sophie, can you just jump in? My name is Ethan Maher, and my this is my project. I was working. Great. My mom and I made this project over three weeks. I built this project because it is relevant to the world right now. The best part of working on this project was making the 3D model, especially the factory, with its blinking aviation warning light, which my dad helped me. The circuitry was the hardest part, but very interesting. I learned about parallel circuits, positive and negative charges, and about conducting materials. The beads for the cherry blossoms were my favourite material because it reflects the light. So that was Ethan's project and um, there was probably about overall around 20 participants who completed their projects and the outcomes for participants it was uh, we kind of looked at we did a, a small evaluation but we did some uh, pre uh, and, and post surveys and, and got some data that way um, so really, I mean, we know that there are drawbacks in long, with, with online learning. And I think for this, the key really was around kind of learning new skills and, you know, uh, being able to solve problems, being able to document your work and communication skills, you know, really because the fact that uh, us as facilitators weren't in the space with them, uh, there was a, a much stronger emphasis on communication skills and then being able to share their ideas with each other and also being able to describe maybe issues or problems that they've had so that we could work together to solve them. There's a lot of really strong emphasis on uh, uh, computational skills as well. Um, and obviously the, the creative element um, uh, was, was, was huge. So 
you know, the, you know, we know, as I said, we know about the drawbacks um, but uh, um, with working online, but, you know, there was definitely some benefits to, um, I think the open-ended nature of working uh, from home really kind of gave uh, participants the opportunity to kind of work in their own time and at their own speed and also spend more time at something. You know, when we're working in person, uh, it's it's always uh, very time limited. And with this case, uh, they, they were given the opportunity to, to continue working in their own time if they wanted to do that. And a lot of them spent an awful lot of time on their projects. And it was really great to see the outcomes uh, after sh such a short uh, time span. So participant testimony, the overwhelming responses were really, really positive. Um, and I think really uh, having uh, the participants kind of think about what my place might be to them and to really try and explore and uh, maybe how it would, would look in the future uh, if they had a hand in, in kind of redesigning it. And there are also outcomes for educators. So, you know, there were so many curriculum links. We worked with primary and post-primary educators to kind of look a little bit closer at that and uh, try and bring out some of the richness of the project. And in addition to kind of to STEAM subjects that, that we know, uh, there were additions to that, and we call this STEAM Plus. So, um, so besides the STEAM subjects, there was English, Geography, Sustainability, um, CSPE, SVHG, um, but also really strong connections to computational thinking, and that's at primary and post-primary levels. Um, key skills, so junior cycle key skills there, and also quite a lot of uh, 21st century skills um, throughout the project too. So as Sophie, uh, um, or well, the, the next paper actually I'll talk about is, is the Trinity paper, but I, I mean, before that it was actually two papers were released uh, within a couple of weeks of each other. This one is the Department of Education and Skills, um, Digital Learning 2020. And so the main areas, um, you know, that, that the, the, uh, the, 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 the research was based on was looking at the use of digital technologies and learning um, within a primary and post-primary context. So at primary level, 62% of schools were uh, using digital technologies and learning, 72% uh, of post-primary. But MakeCreate Innovate in person and online, we, we use digital technologies 100% of the time. And it's not that it's screen-based 100% of the time, we're just engaging with technology in different ways 100% uh, of the time. And um, for us, technology, we do try and step away from the screen as much as possible, and it really isn't part of the kind of focus uh, for us in our workshops and courses. Um, it was also, uh, the, the, the paper also looked at using digital technologies actively and collaboratively in learning. And um, again, primary schools was 41%, post-primary 68 and it may create innovate. We, we do work collaboratively in our workshops 80, 85% of the time. So there's quite a, a, um, a kind of a stark kind of difference between how we work and how uh, if, uh, formal education kind of works in that respect. And then the use, uh, using digital technologies to create new knowledge, content and artifacts. So again, primary is 45%, post-primary is 52%. And again, it may create innovate in person and online, it's 100%. So they're, they're always working to develop new knowledge and skills and to create um, outcomes, digital outcomes. You know, and digital, you know, it doesn't, it, again, it's not necessarily screen-based. It's a physical uh, piece that, that includes technology with it. Um, but there's also a piece on uh, the teacher and, and practitioner learning. And so, you know, even though adults uh, were not able to participate in the My Place project, uh, we knew there was a strong interest and uh, we hope that the educators resources that we put together, along with the online learning content, will provide uh, the support needed for them to deliver the project themselves, either online or in person. And then the most recently published paper from Trinity, uh, Trinity College Dublin, um, looks at the modes of engagement, which, which as Sophie has mentioned, that the more interactive and collaborative uh, approaches to teaching and learning, uh, this, this, this had a much more positive impact on students' engagement, as well as offering more than one format of learning. Um, also maintaining key skills when learning online is really important, um, and junior search or junior cycle key skills and 21st century skills. But obviously, you know, the teacher professional uh, development is incredibly important as it, as it has been shown in, in the other paper that I mentioned. Um, so to be able to create a meaningful uh, uh, integration of technology within sessions and then the learning theories for online uh, teaching and learning. So the, the response to this was whether or not teachers felt that this was uh, something that they wanted. So 80% want uh, pedagogies for online learning, uh, teaching and learning. So they want to, to know more about that. Um, and then also the promotion of student autonomy and promotion of, of collaboration. So, you know, the My Place project for us, we feel is a really good example of how STEAM education on the whole 
works to bridge gaps found in schools' ability to engage with students, to foster collaboration and creativity. And in addition, it also offers educators opportunities to enhance their own teaching practice by engaging them with hands-on cross-curricular approaches uh, to teaching. Um, and if you want to know more, you can contact us here. And um, that's it. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was really interesting. It sounds like such a great project. Um, and I really enjoyed the video. Um, so I'm just going to, we're going to take questions to all panelists at the end. So I'm going to move on to introduce Rob O'Sullivan from CIT Blackrock Castle Observatory. Hi, Rob. Um, and for the questions, Rob will be joined by his colleague Francis, but I think you're, you're just going to take the presentation by yourself. So over to you, Rob. Alrighty. So can we all see the, uh, the PowerPoint okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my name is Rob. Uh, I'm joining you from CIT Blackrock Castle Observatory down in Cork today, along with my colleague Francis McCarthy on our education team. Uh, since COVID hit, uh, we feel we've actually adapted reasonably well to the challenges presented by it. So I just said we'd uh, run through some of the approaches we've taken and see if some of that might be helpful to you or if you have ideas on how we could uh, improve on our own uh, delivery, we'd be delighted to hear from you guys. So the first thing we had to do was basically assess what the disruption meant for us, uh, you know, identify our key audiences, see where we'll be able to continue delivering what we've been delivering and where we'd have to uh, take novel approaches. So the four biggest audience we would have would be tourism, education, outreach, and obviously we would also have to satisfy our funding bodies. Um, so we decided that the best approach to take would be to figure out what each of those audiences want in, an, in a more broad sense and to re, uh, reassess the problem from scratch. So the tourists, when they come to us, they want a memorable astronomy experience. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same way as we ordinarily give it. So we came up with a whole new approach to that. Same goes for the education and the outreach elements. And obviously, as I said, satisfying our funding bodies is a big part of it because if we don't keep them happy, we don't have the lights on, we can't help everybody else. So we decided to approach it in a way whereby we had one central goal that tangentially solved all the smaller goals. And for us, that uh, initial big goal was Space Week. So we uh, coordinate Space Week nationally, uh, funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And a lot of the outreach activities that we do uh, will be intensified and uh, will be featuring particularly prominently during Space Week. So we decided that that would be an excellent goal to help us uh, straightforwardly streamline all of our different projects and bring them into an online capacity. So this is what Space Week would ordinarily look like. Lots of hands on lots of things, lots of people very, very close to each other. Obviously in a COVID-19 environment, it's not going to look anything like that. Uh, but the good news is a lot of what we're doing already is prime for movement to online. So you can see over here, a picture of my colleague, Kui Bean. He's delivering an astronomy show on uh, the astronomy software that we use in our planetarium shows anyway. So a lot of what we would do uh, can be done remotely. <clears throat> so instead of bringing somebody into a planetarium dome, we can stream live to a classroom, to a library, to a home, and deliver an astronomy experience of varying lengths, of varying levels of interactivity, both synchronous and asynchronous. So an awful lot of our projects were basically ready to go uh, in an online capacity very quickly. Uh, you guys may have similar uh, setups for your own deliverables, um, and you don't really have to reinvent the wheel, as I said. This here is my colleague Francis delivering a workshop uh, with my colleague Danielle. So what's great about this is that Danielle acted as a stand-in for the audience that Francis would ordinarily be interacting with. So uh, to deliver a workshop, one, you know, talking head straight at people isn't particularly engaging, um, but by working with another person, it's prime for asynchronous engagement because you can basically anticipate the kind of questions that people may have if they're not physically there with you in the moment, which we found one issue we had with synchronous um, delivery was because parents were working from home, the kids weren't able to borrow the computer to directly interact with us in real time. So having an asynchronous experience proved particularly useful in those circumstances. But at the same time, allowing people to uh, occasionally pose synchronous questions to you so that you could deliver them in real time also had its benefits. So you just got to weigh up the pros and cons of your individual project 
and see what works for you. But what was great for us was that we got to trial that now. Um, and it's something that we've been meaning to do or considering doing for Space Week for quite a long time, because even though this is a challenge, it's also uh, in many ways an opportunity. Moving to an online platform gives a lot of uh, opportunities to reach uh, particularly geographically isolated communities or people who may have to self-isolate as a result of uh, COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, we also thought it was beneficial to develop complementary offerings. So we had a number of programs that we've run over this period. We had these daily astro challenges that were just two minutes long. One was posted every day. They were pretty easy to follow along with. You didn't need any special uh, equipment beyond access to a phone or a computer to just watch these videos on social media. And then at night you would head out and see if you could identify in the night sky what Cleveen had pointed out to you during the day. The weekly planetarium shows then were 10 minutes long. They built on this experience that you had during the week a little bit more engaged and ultimately we would then move on to workshops and panel discussions for older audiences that were a bit more engaged. So you basically offer people a selection of the same idea, but depending on how interested or not interested they are, they can pick the project that best aligns with their interests. But it also means that in terms of our staff and our ability to streamline all of these projects, uh, it was much easier for us. So the same guy that was doing the daily astro challenges was doing the weekly planetarium shows. So he was able to develop a curriculum that fed into the weekly planetarium shows. And if we had workshops coming up, he was able to tell people that those were coming up in the planetarium show. So everything fed into each other. Uh, the other th great thing about the workshops was that we were able to bring in uh, additional resources from Space Week and from Azero Ireland, uh, the European Space Education Research Office, who are a funder of ours. Uh, and these were additional learning, uh, self-taught learning um, resources that parents could bring, for instance, with their children um, and perform little activities at home, various levels of interactivity. We even did a few video walkthroughs of those particular resources as well. And so what we figured afterwards was that the different audiences by uh, giving this variety of, uh, of shows, et cetera, was able to satisfy all our audiences. We were able to satisfy the education audience with the daily astro challenges as well as the tourism uh, audience. The weekly planetarium show uh, basically kept us in the public eye. It made sure that what we're best known for our unique selling point in the planetarium show continued to be offered in some capacity. Um, so that when we do open back up to the public again, hopefully later in the year or early next year, that uh, people will be excited to see the, the new planetarium shows and they, you know, they'll have been following along. They won't, have, they won't have slipped out of their mind. The workshops did satisfy our funding bodies. Uh, we were able to meet the commitments that we had, um, but also it primed us to expand on our deliveries uh, that we've only been able to deliver face-to-face -face so far, uh, which is great and everything, but it, it is fantastic to be able to offer to a wider audience through an online capacity. And then the panel discussions, etc., also made sure that the adult audience were getting something fun for their money. So how all this helps the big picture? Uh, well, we decided that the Daily Astro Challenge would feed into our delivery during Space Week. Um, so we're going to run a Daily Astro Challenge during Space Week as well. The planetarium shows have throughout the year been directing people to the Space Week website and the resources that are needed. Um, we've used the workshops as a trial run for what we're going to deliver during Space Week. And same goes for the panel discussions. And in terms of inclusivity, uh, this is particularly good in terms of uh, geographic isolation and into these so-called STEM cold regions. So what you can see here is uh, our reach over the past three years to different counties. And uh, we found that just targeting the counties uh, year on year where we've noticed that there isn't as many activities and actively facilitating it was the way to go to make sure that we were reaching more people. Uh, Sophie mentioned that a lack of uh, support and technology can be a big issue. And one of my favorite stories from our um, perspective on that was a school, and I believe it was rural Offaly, who had only just gotten broadband the week before uh, when we were able to hook them up with an astronaut for a live chat. So to be able to show a school, look, this is what this technology can do for you um, in terms of enhancing your learning experience and the opportunities that we're offering you, uh, it was really great proof of concept for us. Um, and it, moving to this online capacity is something we've been doing throughout Space Week anyway with uh, a program we call Space Speaker in Your Classroom, uh, where we basically invite space experts from all over um, the world, particularly from Europe and the European Space Agency, to chat with uh, students directly into the classroom like this 
they'll take uh, take questions from the students, give them a brief uh, just uh, talk on their background, uh, but also in terms of uh, gender diversity um, and the age profile of the different people and the diversity of backgrounds that they come from, we also thought it was very important to make sure that we showcase that. And again, that takes active effort from us. Uh, you can open the door for people for sure. I mean, making sure that there are no barriers to participation is important, uh, but I think it's also very important to actively uh, chase and ensure that you're helping uh, people to, to feel welcome in these spaces. So for us, that meant, okay, identify the STEM cold counties. When you're doing your space program, uh, your space speaker in the classroom program rather, if we have to deliver 40 throughout the year, uh, we say, okay, we will open the booking form for 25 to 30, but 15 of them, we are directly ourselves going to seek out STEM cold regions and allocate those 15. Same goes for our workshops. 30% of all the workshops that we do uh, are made available to uh, DESH schools at reduced or free prices. Uh, so actively chasing out um, the the shortfall is, is very important to us. And I do think that having a diverse team yourself um, and looking internally plays a big part in it. So for instance, our team has a good diversity of people from different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. Uh, we've got a very healthy gender balance. We've got a different age balance. And I think it stands to us in terms of noticing when we might be uh, missing something from a project that, you know, you don't want to end up in a mantle, um, a, and thankfully that just doesn't happen with us very often because we're primed for that and we see the benefit ourselves of a diverse team. So my colleague Francis, as I said, will uh, weigh in a little bit more um, in the discussion area. Uh, so thank you for your time. And if you need to get in touch with us, you can find us at bco.ie. Great, thanks so much, Rob, for that. And I can see there's a few questions coming through in the Q&A box. So Robin, sorry, Robin Francis may answer some questions there and we'll maybe take a few of them live at the end. So we're gonna move on now to our next panelist and that's Vicky Toomey Lee from Dublin Maker. So welcome, Vicky. All right, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Vicky and um, I'm the maker of advocate for Double Maker. And uh, uh, so I'm involved with, um, like outside Double Maker, I'm involved with a few not for profit organizations around tech and games events, as well as Advocate University and Tech. So for those who don't know um, what Double Maker is, um, Double Maker is an annual festival. That has been running since 2012. It's family friendly and it's free. Uh, what's more, it's held in a park, bringing along a carnival atmosphere of fun. This festival brings together anyone who's interested in showcasing their projects and skills from traditional crafts like wood turning, knitting, crocheting, right up to high tech stuff like laser cutting, 3D printing, and engaging with the general public on areas of STEAM through making. Uh, just a quick intro to the team for those who don't know. Um, so we have David Coe, who's the co-founder of Double Maker, as well as a lecturer in UCD and press behind, uh, uh, who's also involved with the AirSat uh, One Satellite and also runs Science Hack Day. We have Laura Tobin, consultant researcher and science communicator. Uh, Jeffrey Rowe, um, who is, um, who's CEO of Talk Hackers Space here in Dublin, as well as being on the Engineers Iron Council and Tomas Ford, who is um, co-founder of Double Maker and a uh, professor at uh, DCU. And then there's me. <laughs> so let's rewind a little bit uh, for those who don't know what a maker is, um, because it's a common question. Uh, so a maker who is someone who creates something with their hands, they take things apart, upcycle, recycle, a lot of things that um, Kate mentioned earlier. And this can include everyone from hobbyists, educators, people from libraries, museums, small big companies, artists, crafters, costume makers, you name it, anyone who's interested and curious about making. Um, for Double Maker, this is an opportunity to engage with the public and how creativity and the culture of making can promote the areas of science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. So um, you've probably seen um, MADE here and there. So my role is part of this program called MADE. Um, this is um, a two-year program funded by Science Foundation Ireland Discovery Program. 
It stands for Maker Advocacy in Dublin for Everyone. Um, part of this program was to hire a, a full-time maker advocate, which is where I come in. And part of the job was to connect the fragmented maker community, promote the maker culture, help make help others um, and make activities resources accessible to minorities and disadvantaged communities. And, um, and also um, the job of the maker advocate is also to help uh, the team run maker related events such as uh, Science Hack Day, as well as their um, biggest uh, flagship uh, annual event, which is the Dublin Maker Festival. So uh, just a few examples on what we've been doing and when we're engaging in public before COVID. Uh, so we were um, engaging with um, Dublin City Council Public Libraries, helped them advise on kitting out their makerspace uh, out in Kulak Library, uh, which was uh, launched early this year, at the beginning of this year, unfortunately it was closed and now it's temporary, now it's open again due to COVID. Um, we also helped them advise kitting out a maker van and it made its inaugural uh, appearance at the Dublin Maker Festival last year. Uh, we also worked uh, with uh, the Dublin City Council Culture Company on um, advising on kitting out their community maker space um, at Richmond Barracks. Um, we were connecting them to local organizations to help with its programming. Uh, it was launched um, again uh, early this year, just before COVID. So I think they're still temporarily closed. Um, so what, during that period, uh, um, um, uh, when they were opening up their makerspace, we met up with the local community with them to see how they want to make uh, use of the space and listen to their feedback. Um, I mentioned Science Hack Day earlier as well, so I was helping with the logistics and communications uh, with um, uh, David on, on Science Hack Day. Um, late last year, we were part of Dublin Startup Week. Um, um, we had a Maker Monday where I brought the, I asked Dublin City Council Public Libraries to bring the Maker van out to Dublin City Council offices to show some kind of um, technology like 3D printing. And we also had some talks on the day. Other kind of engagements would be like post sessions at SciComm last year, um, uh, did a, sh a quick uh, talk at um, an assistive technology event called CHAT, uh, promoted maker culture through paper circuits at the Fingal County County Stand, County Council Stand, the BT Young Scientists event, and also was invited to a makers retreat, um, which was organized by makers and educators. So we shout out to Roshi and Markham for inviting me. That was a fun afternoon. Um, so, so, uh, like uh, so we kind of have a far reach to diverse kind of communities from all over, but because of the lockdown, um, uh, the first few months was, for me personally, it was very overwhelming um, because I'm the full-time person and there was so much things that are being put online as well as the government advice, health advice on COVID-19. So I didn't want to make for making sake and putting it online. That takes the joy out of making. And um, although there are some administrative work to be done, but the um, engagement with the community was the challenge for me and the team. Uh, so the, initially the attack was to share information with the community via our social, existing social media platforms, show what other makers are doing and share what they are doing and do those shout outs, trying to push away that isolation. But I did have some maker projects. Um, so uh, from, from our, uh, our end, it was uh, because I was due to go to uh, Berlin Maker Fair in April, which was cancelled. So I took that date as a goal to create something, which was the project I was going to bring along to demo anyway, which is the top right hand corner. It's like print your own Avenger game with thermal printer and Raspberry Pi. And then I created a zine um, below that to accompany, it, accompany the project um, after that. It was actually prompted by one of Science Gary's newsletters on zine workshop. So that was really fun. And I also, uh, so all this kind of um, um, make projects, what I did was I took pictures and documented it. I wrote our, uh, a blog post on it, and then I shared it with everyone um, in the community and whoever's following us on social media. Um, during the period um, in March, everyone was figuring out how to make masks or buy masks. So I wanted to learn how to make a reusable mask and I didn't know how to use a sewing machine, which was like really, really new. So it was a new skill for me to pick up. So again, I documented that as I went along, how I learned to make you know my, my journey of creating these reusable masks. And um, and I and the last one was um, a 20 second countdown timer where the LED lights count down, you know, 10 seconds, change color and count count another 10 seconds. So that's when you wash your hands for 20 seconds. It's a small we maker project. Again, all these kind of uh, projects I, I just documented, um, posted it and shared with everyone. Um, and also, it's just something that um, 
uh, takes my mind off um, the isolation as well. It's a way to connect. But the one of the big things was, you know, connecting with the community. How are we going to do this? Especially um, Double Maker well, Festival is meant to be on um, in in, uh, in June, but it was postponed to next year, next summer. So we thought the team we were discussing about it, and the team said, why not bring Double Maker uh, to the people virtually via podcasting? So we decided to create our first series, chatting to folks like Nathan from Crafty Nathan Creations, to National Print Museum, to Techspace, and to Kay from Make Create Innovate. It was definitely hitting the fall running for me as I never released podcasts before. I have you know, some ideas on editing these kind of um, uh, podcasts, but the logistics of you know, releasing and distributing podcasts was relative, was all new to me, but it was really enjoyable to talk to other makers. It triggered an excitement, excitement on me wanting to make stuff. And I want that for people who are listening as well and the people I'm talking to. And it was refreshing to talk to people um, outside the home. Um, so um, that's the end of my talk. Um, so we're on various social media platforms. Um, Thank you for listening, especially a lot of the kind of challenges, that, the main challenges for me trying to engage communities. It was great to hear from a lot of other organizations, see how they're doing it. And if you have any questions, you can email me at vicky at doublemaker.ie. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I especially like the um, countdown timer for washing your hands. I think that's really great. Um, so, yeah, we've got lots of questions to get to. Um, but just before that, we're going to hear from Claire from Cura. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now. Thank you, Sophie, and hi, everyone. And thanks to Sophie and Moraes for the invitation to join today. There's great hearing some of the other projects. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little, little bit about the public engagement program we have at Quorum. And to, to give you a bit of context about the type of research we're trying to communicate, um, Quorum is one of the SFI research centres. We're a research centre for medical devices. So I'm sure everybody attending the event today is familiar with somebody who's um, I suppose living with a condition, uh, a chronic illness like Parkinson's or heart disease or uh, MS or cancer that really affects your quality of life. So we're all living to, to an older age, which is wonderful, but um, it's more and more common that people are living with these kind of illnesses. And so Quorum's vision, its research goal, is really to, to really improve the quality of life for people living with those conditions through the development of medical devices. And we work closely with industry to translate that research into new generation of, of implants and devices that will, will do that or reach that goal for us. But alongside the um, scientific and industry program in the centre, we have a strong public engagement program. And so as an SFI centre, and there are 16 of these centres around the country, I see some of the public engagement managers here today, um, all of the centres have a dedicated public engagement team to try and bring the research out into the public as much as possible. And that's to support the SFI objective of having the most scientific informed and engaged public. Um, within Quorum then, we were established in 2015, so when we were trying to design our programme back a, a couple of years ago, we decided that in designing the programmes, we wanted to reach out to who we considered experts in the community who would be able to work with us and our researchers to create resources that would then be used across a, a much wider audience. So we have residency programmes for teachers, for artists and for filmmakers at Quorum, which are the three main pillars of our, of our engagement programme. And we have a specific interest in, in targeting underrepresented and underengaged communities with those resources. So a little bit about each of these, our artists in residence program. This is a really lovely project for building relationships with communities, particularly those who have, let's we'll say traditional barriers to engaging with second or third level education or with STEM research or any kind of research information generally. Um, and how this works is that we bring in a, an artist each year who acts as a bridge between our researchers and the community and leads them in, a, in an art project that's inspired by our research, but that is eventually owned by the community. So creating a permanent link with um, a community group that we then build on in the years um, after that. So as you can imagine, this, this is a lovely program, but it very much depends on that face-to-face -face or, or close interaction, building trust and spending time with communities. Um, who wouldn't really have a relationship with the university or with the centre before that. And so this has been quite badly affected by the coronavirus and, and the, the, um, the requirement not to um, spend time in, in such close proximity. But we are continuing with some of the projects. For example, we have one uh, project called Curious Young Minds. It's an SFI Discover project, which targets um, children and families direct provision centres. And so 
one of our challenges, and I suppose the big challenge with this program is to maintain and build on those relationships that were made pre-COVID. Um, and we're developing toolkits that can be used individually rather than collaboratively with us um, during workshops and delivering those kind of resources to residents and direct provision uh, and maintaining that relationship so that when we get to a place where we can have or build on that interaction, we, we, we still have that link. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about that more later. Uh, the second program is our filmmakers in residence. So this uh, is called Science on Screen. And the whole point, I suppose, of this program is to increase the visibility of Irish research and expertise um, and, and use storytelling um, as, a, as a medium to reach our audiences. And this brings filmmakers, our researchers, um, and often patients together to create that story and put it together in short documentary format. Um, this, we find the, the documentaries themselves are a fantastic conversation starter. We use them in all kinds of settings. They've all been broadcast, they've all been gone to, to different film festivals, but we use them extensively in schools, we use them in community settings, uh, through resource centers. Um, and it doesn't matter what your background are, if you're all in a room watching a, a film together, it's a great starting point for a conversation and for Q&A and, and for, for a bit of interaction. Um, in the last few months during lockdown, we've been able to host online screenings of some of the documentaries for patient groups, for example. And later this year, we've decided to turn our, um, I suppose what was supposed to be a big in-person event, our first Science on Screen Film Festival is going to be held online later this year. So hopefully that'll let us engage with a lot of different audiences. Um, and that'll be happening, as I said, in November later this year. Um, our third program really targets uh, teachers, both primary and secondary school teachers. And the idea behind our Teachers in Residence program is to really strengthen the, the support available for teachers, which is hugely important at the moment, um, and building their confidence in bringing STEM research and cutting edge Irish research into the classroom. Um, usually this happens in person and we, we take primary and secondary school teachers into our building and the, the residency runs usually between October and March each year, where they come in, they get familiar with our laboratories, they meet our researchers and together they work on really practical, implementable um, resources that they can use straight away in the classroom and that we can then make available nationally. And that link very closely with our curriculums. Um, this year, because of COVID, we've been able to, and I'm struck by something Rob said in, in his presentation, is with all of our resources, I suppose, and, and during this lockdown, there's no need to really reinvent the wheel. It's about looking at what we had already there and trying to adapt those and offer them in a way that are is supportive for the audiences we're trying to reach. So we were able to kind of look at the lesson plans, kits, activities, and develop online co-teaching resources um, in the last few months. And as we move into the into the next uh, residency phase for teachers, um, this will be done online, but we'll be relying really heavily on feedback from previous teachers and residents and, uh, and the new recruits to educate us on how to make that most effective. And I think a lot of the feedback so far is about, you know, having, multiple delivery channels and, and being able to have short, sweet um, resources that are suitable for use in the classroom, but also for children at home. So there's, there's a lot of work in development with this, um, with that program. This slide is really just to show you the, the reach we've been able to achieve through those programs to date, which, um, so all of them have really great strengths. And, and one of the things I suppose that's, that's worked well for us is that the resources developed through each of these programs are very, mobile, they're very um, useful for each of our audience, each of our audiences, so our filmmakers would very much use the, the art projects or the educational materials, as would the artists be able to educate themselves through the other resources as well. So again, um, these work very well independently as programs, but together as well. And as we move forward, one of the things we're developing as part of the program um, that will very much take into account, I suppose, the challenges that we're facing at the moment is an advocacy platform. And this will really develop a program first uh, around in, uh, in the education of our own researchers about um, how we ensure that we'll say unheard voices have a platform with that patients, particularly in our case, it, with the type of research that Corbin does, uh, but also in terms of being able to make the case for more support for, for research and for public engagement at policy level as well. So that's a very brief, um, I'm just conscious of time. <laughs> um, that's a very brief overview of the, the program and, and how we are working at the moment to, to continue to engage with our audiences, but happy to take more questions. So thanks a million.
Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, super. Thanks for trying. Thanks for sticking to time. Um, I think there'll be loads more um, to talk about once we get to questions. So just before we go to questions from the audience, one thing that we wanted to make sure that we addressed and that we took real notice of was the fact that the people that we're trying to engage with and the people that we're reaching out to during this time um, also have also have their opinion and should be able to voice their experience of lockdown. Um, so what I did was conduct three short interviews with um, some young people who've engaged with Science Gallery Dublin in the past. Um, and just from these three interviews, you can really see like a real diversity in experience of um, coronavirus lockdown, um, a difference in how much they wanted to engage on, online, how much they were able to engage online. Um, so I've edited those down to two minutes and we'll also have a question from each young person as well, because they wanted the opportunity to kind of frame the things that we will be talking about as a community of practice. So I'm just going to share my screen now uh, and we'll start off with a video and interview from Ray Ray, um, who is 21 and a student at Trinity College Dublin. Um, I'm Ray Ray Kapanu. Um, I'm a going into the fourth year human health and disease student. And I first got introduced to the Science Gallery when they were having one of those, um, the gallery exhibition things. And there, someone was like, there's loads of free food. And I was like, free food? But then it turned out to be really cool. Um, well, like at the very, at the beginning, cause like it was kind of started mid-March or something. And so we were still in the middle of college. So the part, my main priority for like the majority of lockdown was trying not to fail my exams and trying to like study and keep up with classes and like teach myself material. So that was like, I was, I was what I was doing for like the majority of um, lockdown. And, and then exams finished. So I was like, oh, okay, now there's time to like <laughs> do anything else. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Yeah, a few things like science gallery for one of you. They're having like these mini lectures or something. I like I don't remember what they're called. I think the mediators do them, but they're like really small yeah. lectures, and they're really interesting because they're kind of quick and like you learn something that you didn't know before. So I quite like those. Um, and oh, then like my local library have a book club, so they're like, okay, like choose a book, and then like we'll like read and discuss. So that, that was really fun, and my friends and I did that as well. So cool. Um, and was that all yeah. Zoom based? Yeah. Everything, everything was Zoom based. <laughs> um, yeah, just kind of like, um, so I was just wondering like what ways or like are there any like new, basically what ways do you think that like the people that are teaching science and um, the people like maybe like mediators or even like the scientists themselves could be more diverse and more inclusive because obviously like representation is really important so um it'd be kind of nice to see people that look like the people that look like the youth that they're trying to reach trying to reach them if that makes sense okay so that is our question from Ray Ray, and I'm gonna invite the panelists to come back on. So turn your videos back on. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important question. I mean, we talk about, um, we can see that there's a science learning divide and that divide between those who access informal and formal science learning and those who don't is often, there are loads of intersecting issues that prevent that kind of access. And we talk a lot about reaching underserved audiences. And I guess Ray Ray's question is about how we can ensure that we're reflecting the audiences that we want to meet. Um, so I don't know, we've probably got just a couple of minutes on each question. I'm not sure who wants to go first. Claire, I know that it's a big part of your strategy. Okay, you've yeah. unmuted yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that. sure, thanks, Sophie. Um, yeah, and and I think like some of the others have said in, in our research center, we're very lucky. We have a very diverse um, population of researchers. So we're, we're working particularly through our artists in residence program, we try and ensure that um, we are reflecting, you know, people can see their role models, if you like. There is a particular uh, community we work with that 50%, um, I think 50% made up of, of, of an immigrant population. And a lot of those nationalities would be reflected in our own researcher base. And it is wonderful. And we've had really good 
feedback for that for, for exactly this point that people, uh, especially younger women, younger girls um, who come from a very different maybe culture of background can see somebody just like themselves talking to them about uh, and giving a workshop and being really positive and really, you know, fulfilled in, in their roles. It, it, it makes something seem a lot more possible to you if, if you see somebody like you um, in that position. So it's, it's one of the things we're really conscious of, particularly through that program where we have the ability to do it. We work with a lot of local communities um, in Galway for that. And so because a lot of our researchers are Galway based, it allows us to do that easily. Um, but it's something we're kind of very conscious of, I suppose, in all of our, with Avon and our films and all the rest of it, that we have a really diverse representation, which, which is an actual fact. So we might want to make sure to bring that to the fore. I think it's really important. Awesome. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add or will we move on to the next question? Okay. Um, so next up we have Roisin. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. Um, and Roisin is 17 and has taken part in the Science Gallery TY programme Open Mind Studio. Hi, I'm Roisin Cork. I'm 17 and I've been involved with Science Gallery and Cisco in the past. Well, when I first started, obviously I was like still in school, so I was like I was in fifth year, and obviously you do a lot of work during that year towards the leaving cert. So I still had to do like my exams and all my school work at home. Mm. So that would have started off being my priority, but then like near the end of the school year, so around April and May, my family then became my priority. So I just like spent a lot of time with my close family. Um. And that was pretty much since, you know. So, oh, I so. did not learn anything. Like, I, absolutely nothing. Like, the only thing I learned is how to use my laptop better. That's pretty <laughs> much it. Like, I did not learn anything. It was, I just don't think, because we had no time to prepare, it just wasn't helpful at all. So it was kind of just... A chaotic time for everybody involved. Um, well, to be honest, I didn't really go online that much. I kind of just stayed like the only thing I did online was like gaming. Like I would have played games with my friends mm. because obviously we can't like go to each other's houses and whatever. But I didn't really go online because everything was just the news, you know. Um, well, I mean, I'm going into sixth year and I'm, I know that myself and everyone in sixth year's time just has absolutely no idea what's happening with like the, the leaving cert exams. So if there, if we were to find out, like just asking them if they have any like resources for us, you know what I mean? Because like I still, I have no idea and I have like ideas of what I want to do in college and I've, I need the leaving cert to like go forward in those. So, and we have no idea. So, like, if we do find out, hopefully Science Gallery can help encourage us through, you know. So that was okay. a question from Roisin there. And um, I suppose she's interested in hearing from, from our community how, how can non-formal and informal science provide resources or support to students in, in school or especially in the Leaving Cert in the coming year, given all the uncertainty? So... Do, would anyone like to maybe start us off on that question? Oh, I can, well, jump in real quick. Just, I know that um, even though we don't predominantly focus on, on leaving cert, I know that through the Teachers in Residence program, it, it's very much about supporting teachers um, so that they can then direct resources to where they need, need to be. Um, as I said, the, the Teachers in Residence program that we're doing this year, it's going to be really looking at understanding how they're going to work. I don't know if they understand that fully themselves yet. So it's, it's I suppose, not about bombarding with resources, but maybe taking their lead um, and, and being able to direct resources to where they're, they're best, um, I suppose, best needed, by, but, but that directed by teachers. Um, that's, that's, I suppose, what we're planning on doing. I don't know if that's as, as helpful as, as wishing we need, but... Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no, you're great. I just got, there's, there's such a, an array of resources. It's really hard sometimes to pick, you know, one or two things that are really going to link in properly. But sorry, Kate, go ahead. 
I was actually just going to echo what, what you're saying in terms of connecting with teachers. I think for us, it's really to show uh, the possibility of curriculum links. We don't work directly with Leaving Cert just because we know how much pressure they're all they're already under, the fifth and sixth year students. So it's not that we can't, it's just that it seems that there's so just no room in the curriculum uh, to have uh, organisations come in and work differently. And I think it's interesting to see what's happened, uh, the, the, the unthinkable uh, that the Leaving Cert has been cancelled. And I really hope that we take the opportunity to to look a little bit closer at how we're measuring students and how the uh, the the, um, the third level th third level institutions are are insisting that students uh, show their intelligence quote unquote through this this kind of leading search system. Um, for us, we're the kind of opposite of that, and what we see with the work that we do is that you know sometimes you know when you see students really struggling with hands on uh, science learning and exploration, is that it's often often it's the academic students that really can struggle because they're outside of this measure, this way that they've taught themselves to learn because they're trying to fit in with a system that actually doesn't work. And I know we need a system. Um, I, I, I agree mass education that there needs to be some kind of system, but uh, I think how we're measuring students and, and the creating a bit of space within that leaving cert cycle uh, that, that, that organizations can come in and explore things a little bit more and, and, and develop skills in a different way and to show the cross-curricular approach because you know, in the real world, that's how we work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something we've been exploring a lot in the System 2020 project, um, looking at various models worldwide for, you know, accrediting the kinds of learning that you can have in the spaces that we work in and seeing how those can go alongside the way learning is accredited through the formal system and the way it's recognised. So um, definitely something that maybe this pandemic might lead to a different way of thinking about those things. Um, so we'll just move on to our last video now, and this is from Adam Lamb, who's a student from County Monaghan, who has also participated in a few science gallery programmes over the past couple of years. Uh, my name's Adam Lamb, I'm 17, and I'm going into sixth year now. Yeah, uh, well... I think most important to me was obviously like keeping safe. So like I didn't really leave the house much during lockdown. I might have went for walks by myself, but it wasn't any meeting up or going to events at all. No one was just kind of trying to get involved in basically everything as much as I could anyway. Uh, so that was my priority was like finding out what's happening online. What can I get involved in there? So I did like get involved in quite a few events and then just keeping my days productive. So, I mean, I am still in charge of running a lot of social media. So that was my main thing was like creating content for that and uh, keeping up to date and like all the committees I'm in. So like just keeping track of work and making sure I'm not falling too behind on that. And then I suppose for me, schoolwork kind of took a bit of a slide because uh, I was getting involved in so many extracurricular stuff. So that was less of a priority for me during lockdown. Uh, and then I suppose just it was kind of an aspiration of mine for a while just to get really involved in like youth politics and youth activism and stuff and getting involved in all these like, organizations so this kind of gave me the free time to be able to like really dedicate my time and effort to them uh, and to actually like find out what I can get involved in. Yeah, to an extent, uh, like I did end up connecting with a lot more friends. Like I actually made probably more friends during lockdown than I have in the past year uh, with like loads of uh, online activities and just got closer with some friends over Zoom calls and stuff. My question would be like, kind of, would you plan to keep incorporating online conferences and learning with what you're doing in person? Okay, so yeah, question from Adam there, which I think we'll get to talking a bit about now, which is, yeah, would you plan to continue um, keeping your online programs alongside things as you open up? Um, and we also had a question just come through in the chat now, which is about how to engage people who don't have access to technology. So I think we'll first think about if we're going to use technology long term and then we'll think about how to engage people who don't have access to that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I know Francis and Rob, you're opening up at CIT BlackRock Observatory at the moment. So maybe you're a good, a good place to talk about whether or not 
digital learning will continue to be a part of your program? Well, I'm going to jump in here and say kind of two things. Um, with the question about technology, which I know, which was the second one, the awareness that I don't know how many teenagers don't have a mobile phone. Perhaps it's it's my my environment, but mobile phones are a fabulous bit of technology. It's not about having a laptop. It's not about having getting in the family if there is one device. Devices like mobile phones, which seem to be joined to the hip to very many teenagers, are a way to engage and work with people who would not necessarily be doing an online course or a, a full engagement. Um, we, as Rob said in ours, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We took activities and engagements that we were already involved with. So our space speakers in the classroom, we've been doing that for a couple of years and we're going to keep doing it. What we have found is this gives us a very good reason to build up a bank of video-based resources, which can be accessed through YouTube. But we are aware that that technology access can be a limit so we work with organizations like libraries who are then mediating for us, connecting to an audience in perhaps a geographically remote area or a user that we don't have time to engage with individually. So work with what's already there. Find the people who are already talking to your audience and work through them. That would be my suggestion and my contribution. Awesome. Yeah, Vicky, do you have something to add um, about the role of technology in learning or and maybe the, the ways to engage with people who therefore don't have access to that? I suppose the first one, because um, I'm it's all quite experimental for us because a lot of our events are like in the park and in people like a lot of the folks here in the panel. panel. Uh, so for us, engaging virtually is a, it's an experimental step for us, even through podcasts, even though I say podcasts are quite prolific. But um, but uh, with uh, my other activities for, you know, learning about live streaming and things like that, it could be something, you know, we, we can look into. But uh, it again, it, it is um, it's like a drop in the deep end for a lot of us <laughs> to to try and, you know, it's technology is accessible for everyone as well. But I think um, for first thing is try to have what like for me, I want to use what I have at the moment to see what we can do and see what can we engage with community with activities with. So we're working our way towards that. And um, for those who don't have like access to, like that was the first thing that came to mind. And Francis said library, I was nodding my head saying, yeah, that will be the first place because the libraries are starting to open up right now. And, um, and that will be the first place. And not everywhere has a makerspace. So that, that, that definitely, like, that's why I was nodding my head when, when Francis mentioned that. But yeah, I, I have no kind of, um, at the moment, yeah, engaging with other organizations to help kind of uh, make it accessible. But for us in Double Maker, you know, I'm just trying to figure that out right now. But for the moment we're doing like, things like baby steps. Um, we love to make move fast on this, but you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to take on, especially if you're a really small team as well. So that's just my, my, just my experience. And could I just jump in, sorry, just on the tech side, we do send out kits and we do think that's actually really key. Now I know we don't send out laptops, so we can only go so far. And the kits are, are, are basic, but they are absolutely necessary and they are low cost. And for us, it's absolutely vital that, 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 that those that want to participate uh, have the ability to uh, use basically almost zero cost materials, let's say found at home, and then the kits that we send out to them so that, that what we do is, is free to them um, and, and that they have as much access as possible. But, but of course, look, broadband and laptops, you know, again, like library spaces, the likes of, you know, organizations that are, that are, that are um, working with communities already, as Francis said, you know, work, work, work with who is there. But we do think the kits uh, are absolutely key for us. That's great, thanks. Um, another one that sprung to mind uh, here in Dublin, I think, is the great work that Trinity Access are doing. Um, their program to provide tech to students, so getting refurbished laptops out to schools. And I guess partnerships with organisations like that, where maybe if they're providing hardware, if organisations like ourselves could be providing content, it could be a good synergy um, in supporting communities. There was another question. Oh, sorry, just to, to go back to Adam's question, actually. Um, about continuing to do things online. Um, I know it's quite a tricky one, like Vicky said, for a small team, if you're trying to 
move forward but now you've started doing things online is it something you can manage to continue um i think for us in science gallery we will definitely try to incorporate these online workshops that we've started doing now as a feature going forward and um i think there is a little bit of extra effort to put in to kind of get them started but i think in the long term it'll pay off so i don't know how does anyone else feel like there's something that you'll keep doing or something that you say no way it's too too much yeah, I, well, if, if I can remember, I think we, we will. There's definitely benefits to continuing online and, and expanding the online presence because one of the things I suppose we, for example, our teachers and residents, we can have a, a much broader reach um, and for all of the, a lot of the others. But we also need to reconsider kind of the, the low tech or no tech approach as well because um, because of the audiences we're really interested in, in, in speaking with. Um, there was a report, UNICEF put out a, um, a kind of a summary of um, data collected education data collected in about 125 countries looking at I suppose multi-pronged approaches so for the first step looking at the technology that people do have or looking at the um, I suppose whether people use do they listen to radio tv you know actually going back right across the spectrum and looking at how can we take a step back and look at different ways not just through and, and you're right Francis it, it looks like when you when you walk around everyone is joined to a smartphone but there may be other ways as well more traditional, I suppose, um, channels that we, we need to start reconsidering again. That you know, radio, for example. I know there's a lot of podcasts out, but radio programs and, and TV programs are still a huge source of information for, for a lot of people. Um, so it's kind of reconsidering those as well. But again, it, it, you're right. There's a huge amount of energy and effort to be to be to, as a, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but you want to be able to to adapt in a way that's actually useful. Um, so there's a bit of work to be done. Um, I think one of the comments by your one of the the, all of the, the, the questionnaires were, was that at the very start of lockdown, other things became priority. You know, I think everybody really at the very start, I know I certainly didn't have the long-term view. It was very much in the moment when it started about how we adapt. But I think now given a bit of time, everybody's starting to consider much longer term strategies and, and that'll be, I suppose that's, that's a harder ask. I think um, I just wanted to go back to one of the questions actually that came up um, which was specifically aimed at BlackRock Observatory, but I think is going to apply to a lot of us as well, which is, do you have information on the demographics of the audiences who took part in your online events? Um, and was there a big difference between those um, participating in workshops online versus attending shows? Um, so maybe BlackRock, I know you've answered it in the, in the text, but maybe that we can talk about it a bit as well. So I'll hand over to you. And then I think Science Gallery Dublin will probably have some thoughts on that as well from our online um, work. Sure. Uh, so the asynchronous stuff is a little bit harder to track because what we were doing was basically uh, live streaming on YouTube. Um, so while we do have uh, analytical software that will let us know, oh, a lot of these uh, visitors came from Zero Ireland, we would then know, okay, they're coming from the European Space Education Research Office. The people that are looking at that are probably teachers um, and they probably have a certain age group. Uh, whereas Francis has done some directly uh, synchronous workshops with schools where we know exactly which class we're, we're dealing with. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. I mean, the asynchronous stuff, uh, you get more bang for your buck. Like you do it once, you put it up, you've done the workshop that one time, but you can reach multiple students multiple times over. Whereas with the synchronous stuff, you have to deal with smaller groups. Um, you're not reaching quite as many people, but then you get far more information on who you are working with. So that there is a trade-off. Um, and I, I know people were talking earlier about the, the, the difficulty with moving into um, an online uh, space, but I, I think it's very important as well to look at it as an opportunity uh, for that very reason. Like our staff here, uh, we have an online explainer who, uh, on-site explainer, who writes all our planetarium shows. And up until recently, he had to write one a month and then deliver that for the month. And then he'd write a new one. Whereas now, because he's freed up to create a video that can just sit online and anybody can watch it anytime they want, he can do one a week. Um, so his time is being used more efficiently where we're still reaching an awful lot of people. Uh, so there is a trade-off to consider in terms of your ability to reach more people. Uh, in terms of the demographics, we haven't quite got to the level of uh, analytics that we want yet since we've come through uh, COVID, but we have lined up uh, ways to assess that for Space Week. So we have identified specific target groups that we want to target with particular programs. Uh, so we're going to do as much evaluation as we can with each of the groups to see what needs they have, how we can work with them ahead of time rather than after the fact uh, to make sure that they're getting the, the best out of the program. Great, thanks Rob. 
Um, we're nearly out of time, but there was just a, one comment there from Sheila in the chat, which was about um, having missed almost three months of classroom time, teachers will be under great pressure to catch up. The challenge will be encouraging them to get involved in extracurricular activities such as SciFest or I guess the programs that all of us here run. Does anyone want to, to comment on that? And yeah, I, I might just say, just speak a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I, I think it will be really, really challenging. What's also, uh, I, I, I just saw yesterday online, is that spaces that would be used, let's say uh, computer rooms and, uh, uh, and other spaces that are, that are used for really important activities are uh, being now uh, dismantled and, uh, and used in order to facilitate social distancing. That's quite worrying for organizations like us. You know, obviously, we, you know, in person is what we do. And um, we will continue online, but we know that, that, that we're not, we, we, you know, we know the difficulties in that and the gaps in that, that and we don't want to further um, um, unequalize the kind of situation. But um, it is, it is uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see at a time when it probably, uh, you know, alternative kind of uh, education is probably most needed. Uh, it'll be difficult to see how teachers who are already going to be really uh, Trying to trying to uh, stay safe uh, are going to manage um, uh, extracurricular activities in their own time, but also working with organisations uh, to come into the schools and, and deliver their work too. So we'll see. I'll have to see what happens. Great. Well, I think we're three minutes over. <clears throat> so. Uh, in true science gallery fashion, <laughs> we've overrun. So I think we should probably um, call it a day um, because. I know we probably all have other Zoom calls to get to. Um, there's one more question which we haven't had the chance to look at, which is from Micah, who actually developed the System 2020 map. And her question is, um, did anyone make use of the System 2020 map in any way during lockdown? For example, to look for resources of other organizations or to collaborate online? Um, and this actually is a really great question for us to be asking now, because we're at the stage of the System 2020 project where we want to understand what the map has facilitated, what kind of collaborations and sharing have, have been made by it. Um, so I think this is a question we're gonna be exploring in the project for the next couple of months. Um, and those of you who are watching who are part of the System 2020 map, it would be really great um, to hear from you and to hear how you've used the map or how the map could be more helpful. And similarly to everyone on the call um, who is presenting, like we're all members of the map. So how can we foster the community and make it more helpful to those of us who are in it, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from me. Marae, do you have any final comments? I um, just want to thank all of our panelists today for a really interesting discussion. Um, to all of our audience for your wonderful questions and comments. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing the recording, we'll be sharing some links. Um, and if any of the panelists want to share their slides, we can pass those along to our audience as well. Um, and huge thanks to our tech support, Mr. Andy Moon, um, looking after us in the background. Um, so yeah, and thanks to my co-host, Sophie. So from all of us, um, it was very nice to be here today and goodbye.